Stefan Ertmans, Guerre Trementina a Incroci di Civiltà. Here we are. We would like to know why this book. Um, because it was something that was given to me 30 years ago by my grandfather, and it was something I had to write because I had promised him when he when he had died, I have put my hand on his cold head and I've promised him that the story he had written in two notebooks, that one day I would make his story and write his story and let the world know what was what had happened to him. So I think it was something I had to do in return for what he had given me. He had given me a very unique testimony of the First World War, really unique. Also unique testimony on poverty in Ghent, in Flanders in the 19th century. So it was my duty to give him the book in return. So the war, first world war, and uh, a dramatic event for all Europe and all the humanity. We are almost dealing about the World War II because it is uh, almost near us, but the foundation of everything happening nowadays starts from World War I. And uh, which is the main importance uh, you put on the book uh, about uh, testifying this uh, dramatic event? Well, the, the story of the First World War has been written so many times, and every time and again we hear new stories being added to it. Um, and what I wanted to do is to write about this small, modest man with a very great soul, who was a, a modest artist copying great uh, uh, paintings of the past, that this sort of Flemish little man, this sort of people who have been through the hell of the four years in, in the trenches, in the mud, in the cold, in the bombings, in the being wounded five times, that these guys had led a life that for us now is hardly imaginable. Those were young guys, they were 20 years, 21, and they were in the most terrifying hell history had ever seen because of the new technologies that were there. And I think that to tell this story adds to our understanding of the past. Because if you read a book by a good historian, that's easy. It's about numbers, it's about politics, it's about kings, it's about uh, um, military. Um, it's about fact and figures. But literature tells the story in a different way. And what I wanted to do is to write the story of the soul of such a small man. What happened in their soul when it was night and you see the bombings and your friend is dying next to you. What was this hell? And this is the place of literature to give the personal story back to the general story. And uh, what you write seems uh, quite like uh, a painting. So you use a lot of words, a lot of adjectives, sentences that we could use describing a painting. Yes. I even wrote my book as a painting. The book is, a, for a good Catholic, it's immediately recognizable. It's a triptych. It's an altar triptych. In the first part, you have the holy Saint Martin, because he was called Martin for his family name. The holy Saint Martin is a child. That in the part in the midst you get the war, you get the holy Saint Martin in the war as a soldier. And Saint Martin was a soldier, he was a legendary uh, in, in the Roman era in the second century, and he became the patron saint of all soldiers, moreover. And in the third part of my book, you find a picture of the saint in his old days, remembering his great love and his passions and thinking at his life which has passed. So even I try to be his copyist. It's a book in which the theme of copy and original is very important. It shows that we all want to be so original, but the very original life of this humble man is because he copied the great ones. He wanted to be like his father. He wanted to be like his grandfather. And this was why he survived it all because he didn't want to be something special. And uh, another thing that comes out from the book is uh, maybe the position of uh, Belgium in, instead of Certainly. the other countries uh, for the war. 
Certainly is. The Belgians didn't want to go to war. They were not like the Germans or the French who wanted war and who wanted to revenge. The Belgians had nothing to do with it. And we fell into this war because we were brutalized by the Germans. So the Belgians were what we call today collateral damage. That's what we were. All the country. And the only thing we did was defending the country, saying, don't touch our country, that's all. But this was, they call it in history, right, in casus belli. What is the casus belli? Well, the casus belli was the Serbs and the Habsburgs. It was not the Belgians. And this means that the courage of the Belgians was the courage of saying, no pasaran. No, pass. no, no, no pasaran, but no pasaran. they passed. They passed. We only kept one small part of the country, thanks to one man who flooded the polders. He opened the sluices of the sea, and it flooded the polders. This was the only way to keep the Germans at a certain still stand at that moment. They sank in the mud with all their artillery and their technology. And this was one humble man having done this, opening the sluices and getting the water in the port. We flooded our own country. This means that we had some 30 kilometers of Belgium left. If this had not been kept, Belgium would have been invaded entirely. But Belgium remained existing although for a small part there for four years against a gigantic enemy. Of course, all the allies have fought with us. The English were very indignant at this. This was a brutal war crime against Belgium. And that is the moment that all of the allied world begins to write about the brave little Belgians who defend their own country against the, the German ogre. And this is, of course, this story which was very deep in the heart of those simple Flemish soldiers. We have to defend our country, that's all. We want to live where we live. And that's an honorable casus belli. Last question. Your book uh, had an immense success. And uh, it's, I think, the first uh, book written on World War I by a Belgian in Belgium. So why do you explain? How do you explain the success? Uh, to be correct, it's not the first. I am the third. But it's but, the few. but my book is completely different. There yeah. were already two novels by other by colleagues of mine, Flemish colleagues, who wrote books out of their fantasy about the First World War. But nobody had written a book until yet based on such memoirs of a real true soldier. So my book is partly non fiction and partly fiction. And this is what makes it so special. And the question I already was raising here in the audience today was, why did we wait so long? In the first place, because there were humble Catholics who had no own culture. In Belgium, their culture was suppressed. There was no, there was no university life, no intellectual life in Flemish until, in fact, after the Second World War only. So, in our literature, we had quite some books on naturalistic poverty, on the peasant life in Flanders, etc. And we had a few great poets, Paul van Ostein, who wrote Occupied City, Beset the Stadt, about Antwerp in the First World War. So we had some things, but not great novels. And I think that exactly the fact that Belgium has been wounded so deeply means that they couldn't talk about it. Every time again, there are readers coming to my table, say, I had a grandfather like you, but he couldn't talk about it. When you began talking about it, he cried and went out. He couldn't talk about it, because they felt so um, attacked, assailed, and they had gone through such a hell that they couldn't really talk about it. Maybe this explains a bit of the reason why we have waited till the third generation before we wrote books about it. That's true. Thank you. Thank you so much.